Hello everyone and welcome to another video. Now this is a GTX 760 Ti. Despite a lack of reviews, this is indeed a real card and as expected it sits between a 760 and 770 performance wise. So why is it so difficult to find? Well the 760 Ti was only ever sold to OEMs like Dell for use in pre-built systems and never had an official retail release. Your best chance of finding one is by looking on second hand shopping sites like eBay where you might see one occasionally appear. Now I don't know for sure but I assume that this GPU was never released as a standalone product because it would have eaten into both the 760 and 770s sales. A gap in the market was certainly there for a card like this but oversaturating their own 700 series lineup probably wasn't in Nvidia's best interests. But is it any good in 2021? Let's jump into some games and find out. So I paid £85 for this card which is round about what you can expect to pay for a 750 50 Ti at the moment. In that sense then I feel that this was a good deal. Let's kick off our gameplay tests by talking about a few issues I faced. Being a 700 series GPU Assassin's Creed Valhalla won't work. You'll get the splash screen logo and then a message about unsupported hardware. Resident Evil Village also crashed, though from what I've seen elsewhere this should actually run on 700 series cards, even the demo version here that I'm running for now. I guess then that this was just a problem I experienced during this test. Moving on to the games that ran fine then, and first we have Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War. For 60fps, which is ideal for first person shooters, the resolution scale will need to be dropped to 80% of 1080p, and while the in-game settings are best set at their respective lowest, I did make use of the high anti-aliasing option, as otherwise there are some pretty horrible jagged edges. We were still averaging at least 60fps today, and while each map's performance will differ, 80% of 1080p should be good for 60 fps or more most of the time. Now you may have noticed but the card does get rather warm, not to the point of throttling but it doesn't take long to exceed 75 degrees in most titles. It is a single fan blower style card after all. I should also mention that this card does support the latest drivers, being a 700 series card you can still use the latest Nvidia drivers with it. Crisis Remastered will run at a native 1080p with the low preset and 1x SMAA enabled. First of all, the cap was stuck at 37fps, which is half my monitor's refresh rate, but enabling and then disabling VSync from the graphics menu fixes this issue. Overall, the average frame rate came back at 63, though there were a few drops here and there, which tends to happen regardless of GPU power. This is just something that happens with Crisis 2020. It still looks great on low settings though, and switching to medium or high will have a big effect on performance metrics, so low is certainly the best option for this card. In Cyberpunk 2077, targeting 30fps is as simple as turning everything down to low, keeping the resolution at 1080p and then enabling the resolution scaling and turning this down to 70%. Doing this meant we saw a 33fps average, though there will certainly be some stutters. It is playable if you don't mind a more console-like experience, though having said that I think this will still run better than the game currently does on base last gen consoles. Anyone wanting to target 60 FPS should be prepared for severe eye strain and headaches as the only way to get close to this is using 50% of 720p and what's that 360p something like that. Even then achieving 60 FPS constantly isn't possible but this was more of a test of curiosity and I think that anyone looking for a GPU like the 760 Ti probably knows that Cyberpunk will be best suited to 30fps. Fallout 4 can be set to use the high preset with no further changes, and doing so will still mean at least 60 frames per second even in busier areas like Concord. I left the game capped, otherwise there will be some physics issues, and in this case the game will hit the 75fps limit when there isn't much going on. The difference between high and ultra settings to me is pretty negligible, so high is definitely the better bet here, and to be honest it will ensure that there aren't going to be as many stutters and dips. Fortnite can be surprisingly demanding, with the settings turned right up, so medium at 1080p seem like the best option here for a nice combination between decent visuals and good frame rates. Despite the decent average, there were certainly some severe frame drops, but these weren't necessarily picked up just by playing the game. 
the frame rate monitor actually picked up these changes. I couldn't feel many dips and stutters, but according to MSI Afterburner, they were there, so that's something to be aware of. In my experience, Fortnite tends to dip and stutter with a lot of hardware though, just like Crisis Remastered. Despite nearly maxing out the video memory by adjusting GTA 5's in-game graphical options, it still ran pretty well with most settings including textures set to high. We could have gone a little bit higher with a few options I'm sure, but then again we were seeing a nice mix of graphical quality and performance, and keeping the settings at high instead of very high sort of acts as a countermeasure to any frame drops. Where we might see a dip below 60 FPS at very high in a particularly intensive area, the same dip may only take us down to 70 or so FPS with the high settings in that same area. Okay, so in Red Dead Redemption 2, I used a mixture of settings to achieve a plus 30 FPS average at 900p. The texture quality had to be set to low, though I turned a few other options up here and there. It still looks pretty good. I mean, there's no escaping the muddy floor textures and the way certain objects look close up, but because the 760 Ti is a two gig GPU, it will suffer if we turn the aforementioned texture settings up outside of the game. I then tried to target 60 FPS like I did in Cyberpunk, but even 720p low couldn't make this possible. I suppose we could have made use of a lower res scale again, but that would just ruin the experience to be honest, and I'd rather play at a native 720p, or preferably 900p, with the settings beforehand at closer to 30 FPS, but it always depends on personal preference. Finally in The Witcher 3, an older but demanding title, we have a couple of choices once again. The first is to set the graphics to high and the post processing to medium. I also switched hair works off, which I tend to do anyway. This will offer up the best looking visuals while keeping a 30 plus FPS target in mind. There will be a few drops from the 46 FPS average, but the game shouldn't drop below 30 FPS very often, if at all, with this config. The second option, and one that may be more appealing this time around, is to set everything to low, including the graphics and post-processing. And this will mean 60 FPS on average, but there will be some drops below this, especially in places like Novigrad, unless of course you want to drop the resolution a bit more. Overall, the 760 Ti isn't much to look at, it will perform okay these days, and you will have to make a few sacrifices to resolution and graphical settings. This OEM graphics card offers better performance than the next Ti card down the ladder, the 750 Ti, and will also do better, ever so slightly that is, than a reference 760, though with a little bit of overclocking on a better 760 you could probably get better performance from this. And let's not forget that the 760 Ti essentially is a rebranded 670, so yeah, that card and the 760 always used to trade blows in games of their respective eras. With all that said then, thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this one, leave a like on it down below. Leave a dislike if you didn't. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already. And hopefully, I'll see all of you in the next one.